Hello, hello. Welcome back to Green the Grid and Electrify Everything, which is presented by New Yorkers for Clean Power. My name is Cal Truman, and I am the Education and Careers Coordinator for NYCP. This is video four in the series, and we will be talking about transportation. If you haven't watched the previous videos, uh, this, this section does build on some of the previous ones, but it also hopefully can stand alone. So without further ado, let me share my screen and we'll begin. Great. So transportation. At more than a quarter of state emissions, transportation is the second most carbon intensive sector in the state. So it's providing the second most climate warming pollution out of the six categories. New York is known for its public transit, but it's concentrated mostly in urban areas. All 62 counties and many municipalities have regional bus service and Amtrak and Metro North provide long haul rail to parts of the state, but effective public transit can be very difficult to access in rural areas. So as a result, outside of New York City, um, if you don't count, and it's actually just the boroughs of the Bronx, Queens, Manhattan, and Brooklyn, um, if you don't count those four boroughs, 75% uh, of New Yorkers drive to work alone in a personal vehicle. So most of us are driving a whole car for just ourselves. Um, this chart just shows uh, ground transit. We're gonna be mostly talking about ground transit. So vehicles that drive on the road. 96% um, of the vehicles driving around in New York state are what are called light duty vehicles. So that's you know personal cars, that's pickup trucks, it's things like that. Um, and so because those are 96% of the vehicles on the road, it means that 82% of the emissions uh, from ground transit are from light duty vehicles. So I know I tend to assume that big diesel trucks and tractor trailers and buses are the ones doing all the polluting, but just because of the, the proportion, their impact actually pales in comparison to the impact of regular people just driving their personal cars around all the time. So that's rather surprising, I think. So what's to be done? It's definitely important for the state and municipalities to keep working on expanding public transit, making streets more walkable and bikeable, and improving options for shared mobility, like car shares. Um, so talk to us after, uh, you know, send me an email or um, go to our website after the presentation if you'd like to get involved in those sorts of initiatives where you live. But in the meantime, for everyone who relies on a personal vehicle, which is most of us in rural areas, um, the best thing you can do is make it electric. Every major car manufacturer is making electric vehicles or EVs, um, electric vehicle EV. And many of those car makers have pledged to stop making internal combustion, gas and diesel vehicles all together by 2035. This is in line with New York's uh, pledge to stop sales of new uh, gas and diesel powered light duty vehicles as of 2035 also. Um, and California recently passed similar legislation that's being taken up in many other states that um, copy California's emissions laws. So 2035 is going to be a, a real pivotal year for the switch to uh, electric vehicles. And we've, we've already seen the tipping point. Um, it's become very difficult to find a new electric vehicle, actually, if you're shopping. Um, you generally have to get on a waiting list. So think ahead. Um, and uh, as I mentioned in the uh, building section, some of the constraints on this supply chain are looking to be smoothed out in the next few years so that there will be enough supply of the batteries specifically that go into these cars um, to, to uh, keep up with demand, which currently there aren't quite enough. The other thing is that as more options come onto the market, as there are more um, new electric vehicles available um, and early adopters trade up for newer and faster, longer range electric vehicles, there will be increasing choice in the used electric vehicle market, which I am keeping an eye on. Um, it's also worth noting um, that at the federal level in the Inflation Reduction Act, which passed um, just recently in 2022, there are uh, t rebates available for purchasing not only new but also used electric vehicles. There are some constraints on which vehicles um, are eligible for the rebates, but um, it's very exciting to know that used vehicles will also be eligible for rebates because that really helps make electric vehicles more accessible to folks who have limited 
means to purchase a vehicle. As far as trucks, so as I mentioned, pickup trucks are generally considered light duty. Um, and so those also have to be zero emissions by 2035. Zero emissions just means like they could be electric or they could run on something else that doesn't use fossil fuels and release um, greenhouse gases, but it, it, can't, it can't be running on gas or diesel. So those have to be, any new um, pickup trucks will have to be uh, zero emissions by 2035. As far as medium duty and heavy duty, so that's dump trucks, that's trash compactors, that's 18 wheelers and uh, tractor trailer trucks, those get an extra decade. They get till 2045 because they are more difficult to electrify um, or more difficult to make um, uh, zero emissions. So that technology is a little further behind, so they get a little extra time to work on it, but uh, electric vehicles are here, they're easy, so the, that deadline is pretty soon. Um, and it's also worth noting that um, school buses are an exception. I believe that we are phasing out diesel school buses also by 2035. Um, in fact, I'm going to pause and check on that for you. <laughs> Oops. Let's see. Oh, I can't. Anyway, um, I believe that, the, that school buses also need to be zero emissions by 2035, which is great news as far as childhood asthma, which is related to diesel from idling school buses. So looking forward to that. The other nice thing about electric school buses is that the times that they're um, resting in generally include the summer when there's very high demand for electricity for cooling. And so the batteries in these huge buses can be used to supply electricity to the grid like they can save the electricity when there's extra from you know solar panels during the middle of the day, for example, and then when that energy needs to be pulled away the school buses if they're sitting idle, you can take that energy back and just use them for storage to support the electric grid. So electric school buses are really uh, an excellent uh, upgrade both for public health for emissions and for stability for the electric grid. So the end game here. The big, the big picture when it comes to having to own a personal vehicle, if you're not able to get around um, primarily via public transit, which is certainly better. Um, but the end game here for personal vehicles is we stop driving all these vehicles that depend on fossil fuels for power. And instead, we're charging electric vehicle batteries with renewable energy for emissions free transportation. There's no pollution coming out of the tailpipe. That's the end game. Now there's a term let's say range anxiety for the worry of driving out in an electric car and getting stranded too far away from a car charger to refuel. So you're, you're driving out, you're in the middle of the road, your, your battery is low, there's nowhere to charge it, and then you're stuck. That's range anxiety. And that's a big reason why a lot of people don't want to buy um, an electric vehicle. So this, uh, this slide is just to show that uh, chargers are becoming a lot more accessible. So it's true that inconsistent access to EV chargers um, is a problem. And, you know, as I said, it makes people hesitant to invest in an electric vehicle. So plugshare.com is a website that maps out publicly accessible charging stations, not necessarily, you know, not including ones at people's houses, just ones that are available to the public. And this screenshot is just to show that they're becoming more common, even in rural areas. So gas stations, municipal parking lots, rest areas, shopping centers, hospitals, and schools are all great locations to install EV chargers, potentially earn a little revenue for the municipality, um, and encourage wider adoption of electric vehicles. Of course, they can also be installed at private homes, but this is just you know to, to let folks rest assured that the public EV charging network is expanding all the time. And this has been supercharged recently, again, by the Inflation Reduction Act. So if you want help encouraging your town to put in municipal chargers, get in touch with us. That's something we can help point you towards resources for. Expanding the EV charging network statewide and nationally is going to be critical in getting this transition right. So that is the transportation portion of Green the Grid and Electrify Everything. Please uh, hop on the next video to learn about electricity. Thank you so much.